All right, let's wait for a couple of seconds until we get the attendees up and then we can get started. Great, looks like everyone is slowly trickling in. Okay, fantastic. Why don't we start now? Um, welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure to have you here at the annual School of Security Studies Conference. Um, this is our very esteemed IR and ethics panel and it's entitled Looking Through the Fog of War, Interdisciplinary Lenses. And as you'll see, and as we go very quickly through our amazing speakers, our ethics, IR and ethics theme is really, really interdisciplinary. We have a lot of different lenses to kind of make sense of this phenomenon of war, which has been really in the news in the last six months or so. It's a real pleasure to have you here um, on Zoom as well as live streamed on YouTube. So without further ado, we get started with Francisco Lobo, who is a PhD candidate in um, here in the Department of War Studies. Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, for inviting me to speak today. Um, so I was told to be brief. I will keep it brief and simple, but not simplistic, uh, following my supervisor's advice, Maria Baracki. So um, yeah, I will be talking about uh, use Gogan's norms, this uh, special kind of norm uh, that we have in international law and how they have been uh, applied or uh, resorted to uh, in the conflict in Ukraine, uh, at least in the discourse, in the narrative. So uh, Alvina has my slides. Okay, next. So uh, in the first slide, I wanna show you, um, I wanna show you the definition of use Gogan's uh, in international law. Um, it is a very obscure Latin phrase, right? But what it really means, it's, it's really simple. Um, it's a boundary on the um, uh, power that states have to conclude treaties. So um, it's defined as a uh, uh, peremptory norm of general international law according to uh, this treaty, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. So a lot of lawyers think this actually is a natural law, not positive law, but it sounds, uh, it doesn't sound very uh, like natural law to me, that no references to reason, the common good, nothing like that. So it's very uh, formalistic in my opinion, but this is the concept. This is the legal concept of use Kogans. It's still very, like I said, neutral, empty uh, in the next slide. Uh, we can see how the uh, UN International Law Commission has tried to flesh out a little this concept for the past six years or so. So they have said at this commission that peremptory norms of general international law or use Kogan's norms reflect and protect fundamental values of the international community. They are universally applicable and are hierarch hierarchically superior to other rules of international law. So uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that they reflect fundamental values of the international community. So they are the intersection actually of ethics and law. Uh, that's why some lawyers actually don't like them because they think it's, it's too much morality and not a lot of uh, law in them, uh, which is perfect for, for this panel actually. <laughs> so, and uh, what about some examples? Finally, in the next slide, we can see uh, uh, a bit more fleshing out of this concept, the same commission at the UN, they have come up with a, a bunch of examples of uh, use Gogan's norms uh, that everybody could agree on, uh, apparently. And the list is very, uh, uh, it's a minimal list, but uh, very important. So it's a bunch of prohibitions, the prohibition of aggression or aggressive war, the prohibition of genocide, the prohibition of crimes against humanity, uh, basic rules of international humanitarian law, that is the law of armed conflict, the prohibition of racial discrimination and apartheid, the prohibition of slavery, the prohibition of torture, and finally a positive one, the right of self-determination. This is like the non-exhaustive or illustrative list that the uh, International Law Commission came up with a couple of years ago. Uh, some states, if we go to the next slide, some states have liked this idea of having a list with examples of use Kogans, some states have it. So we have a, a list here of uh, uh, states who support or are against the list uh, in favor of it are Austria, Belgium, Colombia, Italy, Japan, Poland, Portugal, South Africa, and Switzerland, 
uh, and against having a list, uh, Australia, the Czech Republic, uh, Denmark, on behalf of uh, the, the, uh, all those states, Sweden, Iceland, Norway, and Finland, France, Germany, Israel, the Netherlands, Russia, Singapore, Spain, the UK, and the US. They don't like this list. They're, they're not against, uh, so this is important to highlight, they're not against the concept of use token. They just don't see any added value uh, in this list. So they prefer to keep it more abstract uh, and flexible. So uh, what, in the next slide, we can see finally what this means uh, for the purposes of today's uh, presentation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, use tokens uh, reflects a reality in international law and international politics, which we could call legal polytheism. So polytheism, you know what it is. Uh, it means you worship several gods instead of the one god. And uh, what I have seen in legal practice and discourse and uh, in the literature is that uh, everybody worships a specific kind of god from the list or the illustrative list of Euskogans, or maybe more than one, but uh, everybody favors one at least. And uh, it's very protein, it's very um, uh, malleable in that sense. And that means that conflict and uh, contestation is inevitable, just as with the politics. So um, let's see an example, just to bring it home with the, the war in Ukraine in the next slide. Uh, we can see how both Russia and Ukraine on the West have used this same list uh, uh, to their advantage or uh, to, to uh, bolster their own narratives about the war. So, and it's basically the same standards, but used differently. This is what is so interesting. So uh, Russia prays to the gods of uh, the prohibition of genocide. They actually said they invaded to prevent the genocide. Um, we can see that Ukraine and the West also pray to the prohibition of genocide. Actually, Ukraine sued Russia uh, at the ICJ because they are misusing or abusing the concept of genocide. Prohibition of aggression. Also, the Russians say, oh, but this was in self-defense preemptively. And the Ukrainians, of course, they say, well, this is an actual self-defense. We are being attacked. Basic rules of IHL. Uh, the Russians have uh, played with this a bit more. They, they're, they're not referring, of course, to war crimes. Uh, it's not convenient, but maybe they are relying too much on the principle of military necessity. Whereas, of course, Ukraine and the West, they are highlighting the, the perpetration of war crimes <laughs> all over the place and documenting it thoroughly. And finally, self-determination. Everybody is talking about self-determination. Russia says it's, it's, it's because of self-determination self in the east of the country that we are doing this. Uh, Ukraine says it's because of self-determination as a nation, as a whole, that we are uh, resisting. Um, and uh, yeah, the next stage in this, uh, the final slide uh, shows the next stage in this uh, judicial or legal battle. I know there's an actual battle going on, don't get me wrong, but it, it, it also has a, a legal dimension. And the next stage will be, well, uh, in court uh, at the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. So uh, like I said, uh, Ukraine sued Russia because they're abusing the concept of genocide. Uh, the ICJ believes they have jurisdiction to uh, hear this case. The Russians don't agree, but uh, in the end, the court uh, said they have to submit uh, their, their briefs to Ukraine in September of this year, Russia in March of next year, and then who knows when it, this is going to end. Um, but it is, it is a judicial case already, a legal dispute. Um, so like, like I said, everybody's using use tokens, and uh, more specifically the list. Uh, as a form of legal polytheism, praying to the gods that are more uh, convenient to, to each of them, or maybe the same god, but you have a different inter interpretation of the same uh, um, doctrine. So that's about it. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So this is our legal lens on the problem of war as it kind of unfolds and um, is becoming transformed in contemporary times. Our second speaker will be Dr. Lola Frost, who is a research fellow also here in the Department of War Studies. And let me just get the slides up for you. The floor is yours, Lola. Thank you very much, Alvina. So wonderful to be here and to be with my colleagues. Um, so my question today is, what is the work of art? for violence against women. And the work of art, by which I mean, it is what the work of art does. <clears throat> and it's sometimes difficult to describe. <coughs> Indeed, our experience of art tends to exceed what we can say about it, but even as it calls for interpretation. And I'm not going to go into the study of aesthetics, which has spent a lot of time trying to figure out that, that conundrum. 
uh, but generally just to stay, stay with, to stay with their conclusions that it seems to all of us that this, that one of the most important things we can say about art is that it educates us. There's a kind of aesthetic education at work in the work of art. And I've been interested in what is politically, ethically, and normatively at stake in the aesthetic education of art, in its provocations particularly. And in this brief presentation, I look at four images to explore how ethics, recognition, normative regulation, and resistance are intrinsic topics to our experience and interpretation of art. But before, so, before I do so, a few thoughts on what the work of art can do for the injustice of violence against women. And I suppose in that sense, I'm thinking about what you've said before. So unlike war, which is commonly perceived of as the public enactment of militarized aggression between societies and states, practices of misogyny and violence against women are mostly conducted beyond public scrutiny. That secrecy is not only an index of the failure of women's rights to freedom and equality, but is also an indicator of how those who conduct misogynistic abuse and violence against women refuse to recognize the rights, dignity, and freedom of women. And this raises the specter of an omnipresent fog that obscures those arguments and practices mustered to sustain control of a woman's bodies, desires, and agency. So on this score, I suggest that works of art cannot deliver justice, but they can mediate injustice. And they do so by illuminating the normative failures of that misogynistic fog on this topic of the payment of the arguments as well. So the work of art involves what some call an aesthetic education, which is generally registered as an ethically entangled provocation. It's much more than that. It's an enormous event, which I could, you know, aestheticians spend a lot of time trying to explain, but let's just stay with this idea of an aesthetic education. And indeed, to be a practice Oh, sorry, to be a participant in the practice we call art, all of us are inscribed into its rules, which frame an experiential and pluralizing spectrum that bears between and across sense and understanding. And as co-participants in that practice, artists and audience, audiences grapple with processes and affects which challenge representation and invite imaginative interpretation or creative ecstasy or affective dis disavowal all of which are both ethically and normatively shaped. So we look at our first example. It's, a, it's a, not a good quality image because I had to get it off the net, but um, this is a work by Penny Siopis, who is a very distinguished South African artist. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a small painting, part of an enormous series that she did in two, between 2002 and 2005 as a response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, you know, this small sample is, gives you a sense of it, but uh, registers as a, as a series, it, its effects are remarkably compelling. And those effects provoke our recognition of the psychological and ethical offense the rape and violence against women entails. And Siopis's astonishing shame series, which I just tried to sketch for you, I suggest is both an identification with that shame as a call to compassion and an indictment of misogynistic, the social, sorry, a misogynistic social order that produces it. And uh, Siopis claims that this body of work is the articulation of what she calls a poetics of vulnerability. And by this, she means, I think, that these images carry the vulnerabilities of those whose violations she seeks to make public as well as something of her effective and creative commitments that require her own undoing, itself an ecstatic, ethical, and normatively uh, inflected aesthetic performance. Next question. Louise Bourgeois claims that childhood family traumas relating to her father and the patriarchal construction of her female identity were exorcised through her art practice, whose narratives of desire, transformation, and resistance mount a subliminal critique of misogynistic and patriarchal norms of domination. So Bourgeois' famous spider sculptures, which we see here, allude to the strength of her mother, where met metaphors of spinning, weaving, nurture, and protection provoke and threaten alternatives to the fellow-centric status quo. 
These provocative, mesmerizing, threatening, and protective creatures offer ethical alternatives to the phallocentric status quo by invoking a sense of an alternative and grotesquely beautiful female power. Next one, please. My painting, titled Coming Alive, is saturated by libidinal investments and is part of a long standing quest to resist the repression of desire and the subordination of women. The fractal life force of this painting is folded into this headless, limbless, visceral, umbilical body called assemblage that rises vertically and aspirationally against the violence of my own self regulation, as well as those repressions laid down by a fellow centric project to demean, silence, and control women, including their bodies and desires. Like bourgeois spiders, this abject assemblage mediates and contests misogyny by violation by confronting the view of vulnerable, excessive, grotesque, raging, and hence normatively unspeakable female power. Last but not least, Zanelli Moholi's image titled Apilele is an interrogation of a politics of representation and of the gaze. In the traditions of portrait painting and photography, the work of that gaze has also been pressed into suspending racial, gendered, and heteronormative hierarchies that disavow racial violence and demean women of color. Moholi's activist work within the LGBTQI plus community in South Africa um, is uh, an explicit address of the gender conforming, the violence that gender conforming individuals suffer because they threaten that hegemonic normativity. To end, <clears throat> my, my, sorry, my um, argument is, is that work, that the work that art does, simply put, is registered as an interpretive and experiential nexus. I have argued that this nexus is both normatively saturated and ethically alive, and that the work of art is a diagnostic of both the power of and resistance to misogynistic control and abuse. Such artistic mediation is oblique and pluralizing, but it is also intrinsic to the practice we call an aesthetic education, whose ethical, diagnostic, and transformative potential should not be as underestimated. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lola. Next, we have Professor Vivian Jabri, who is a professor of international politics, also here in the Department of War Studies. And Vivian will be joining us online. Okay, thank you very much, Alvina. And that's so far the panel has been great. So let me try and offer my bit to to this to this um, uh, engagement with the subject of war and how we move on. The question for me is always: What concepts do we use in understanding the wars of our contemporary era, but also wars across the modern period? And one of the interesting aspects of what's going on in the present moment is the juxtapositioning of what scholarship as well as in the wider public sphere is known as the liberal international order. So we have that as a concept and it's given a number of understandings and renditions, I would say versus the post-colonial international order. So I will focus on the post-colonial international order because that is what we have in, in the present juncture of, uh, of historical development of, of the international system. The post, by post-colonial international order, I mean an order that actually fundamentally changed when the formerly colonized countries gained access to this realm of politics that we refer to as the international. I think this was a hugely significant uh, period of history whereby the post-colonial societies through their anti-colonial struggles brought into the discourse of international relations, issues relating to racism, issues relating to self-determination and specifically the right to self-determination. And I would suggest that in, the, uh, in our contemporary era, and particularly in, in the late 1990s and 2000s, the post-colonial international order 
including its, if you like, legal, juridical, political structuring, its normative structuring, has actually been transgressed uh, to, to a very significant degree and in, in, indeed challenged to a very significant degree. And post-colonial societies and, and, their, and their governments have in a sense responded very, um, have responded to this in, in a multitude of ways from voices rendered at the United Nations, but also um, if you like on the streets so I would suggest that the emergence of what we've come to, to know as the Arab Spring before the civil wars in, in Syria and, and the civil war in, in Libya, I would suggest that one of the instigators of the Arab Spring and the protests on the streets of a number of Arab countries uh, actually was a response to the transgression of uh, the post-colonial international order. So what were these, these trans, transgressions? These came about in terms of the interventions, both military as well as, uh, if you like, at societal level, the interventions that took place in the 1990s and into the, into the 2000s, which we would normally refer to as liberal wars. We refer to them as liberal wars because the if you like, the states that were involved in this, uh, in those interventions were indeed liberal democratic societies led by the United States. So the intervention in, in Iraq primarily, um, but also prior to that interventions on the Balkans and so on. The discourses that uh, framed these interventions related to humanitarian wars, so the idea of the rescue of populations, for example, in Kosovo. Uh, in relation to, the, to Iraq, they um, were framed in terms of counterterrorism, uh, but also very significantly, as we all know, regime change. And with these discourses, came the uh, dichotomy that we use in international relations relating to war, namely the uh, difference between legitimacy and legality. So a number of uh, scholars who, um, if you like, rely on the notion of legitimacy and Francesco has in a sense alluded to this when he talked about uh, the norms of, of the international order. So a number of scholars would suggest that um, humanitarianism as, as a motivation for war uh, is, is, in, is indeed about uh, this idea that wars can happen in late modernity uh, relating to res the rescue of populations, humanitarianism, and, and so on and so on. However, those who focus on uh, legality and the idea of the uh, bounded, limited sovereign state um, would, would if, if, if you like, focus on the, what constitutes the post-colonial international order, namely the uh, self-determination and uh, sovereignty of the limited political community. So this is a genuine, uh, both ethical and um, political debate that goes on in the discipline of international relations and that clearly exercises all of us when it comes to our judgments about warfare. So liberal wars as, as, these, uh, as these came to be known, saw the global as the, re as the remit of operations, so the uses of, of militaries involved both um, warfare, direct, the use of direct violence against, uh, against populations, and primarily these populations were located in the post-colonial world, um, but, but also, if you like, actions, particularly in Iraq, which uh, relate to the global political economy. So for example, the... Um, uh, sudden and wholesale privatization of Iraq's oil industry, 
the introduction of uh, GM crops, for example, into, into uh, Iraq and, and so on and so on. Um, in terms of tra transgressives um, or the transgression of, of international law and, and the norms of the post-colonial international order, um, these came about in, in the occupation, particularly of, uh, of Iraq during that period. So what of where we are now, and, and very quickly, I'm very aware of uh, time passing. What is the war in Ukraine and how do we characterize that war? I've suggested in the title that we might in a sense characterize it uh, in, in terms of um, uh, a nationalist or a totalitarian uh, based war. Why do I say this and how has the post-colonial world responded to this particular war? So it's driven, as, as we all know, by a nationalist ideology, but it's a nationalist ideology that has a kind of pan-ethnic national uh, agenda to it. And this is seen in, and it's very clear in uh, the speeches that, that, that Putin has given. Um, so rather than seeing this as a kind of global remit, you might uh, conceptualize the, the, the Ukraine war more in terms of a, a, a sort of regional, uh, nationally, ethnic, nationally driven um, conflict. However, uh, there is more to it as well, and hence the use of my word totalitarian, obviously um, very much, I'm very much influenced by Hannah Arendt's reading of totalitarianism. The war uh, is also in a sense driven by what is uh, the politics, not just of the region, but the internal politics within the uh, Russian uh, Federation. So where liberal wars depoliticize conflict in a particular way, uh, suggesting that conflict is about humanitarianism and so on and so on. Totalitarian wars de uh, depoliticize conflict, not just in terms of this focus on uh, ethnicity and culture, but also in relation to actually seeking depoliticization. So um, the, the war in Ukraine and this kind of pan, uh, uh, you might say pan-Slavic uh, ideology might be also to do with the internal politics that are going on in Russia and the drive against, um, if you like the, to, again, to use an Arendtian term, uh, the right to politics. So uh, what is the right to politics? It is about a presence in the public sphere. It's about the expression of um, the right to contest what goes on, not just uh, in relation to government policy, but also to other uh, participants in that public sphere. It's about taking away the space, the actual material space, but also the discursive space wherein politics actually takes place. So uh, the war in Ukraine is very much connected to the internal politics of uh, what is going on in the within the Russian state. And this is very interesting because it raises a number of questions about how we compare uh, wars and the, the motivations behind them. Um, what concepts do we use? What are the discourses that frame each particular war? It's not about a comparison so much as actually understanding the dynamics of each of these different types of war. Now, each of them involves violence against populations, as we saw in Iraq and as, we've, as we continue to see in, in, in Ukraine. The interesting question for us is in relation to how we conceptualize these different kinds of war, but also to be very curious about how the post-colonial world responds. And in terms of the response to uh, this particular war from the post-colonial 
uh, world. What, what we've seen and, and as personified by the Kenyan representative at the UN, what we've seen is that there is absolute recognition across the post-colonial world, though some of that world abstained at the UN General Assembly, um, that, that there is an understanding of this war as indeed a nationalist driven uh, imperialist uh, war, but that imperialism is understood as in, in a sense very much in, in, in terms of as it has always been understood in terms of uh, the right to self-determination. And you can have a look at the Kenyan representatives um, speech at the Security Council when it happened and it's there on the UN uh, website. So I'll just conclude there. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Vivian. Being muted, but okay, I think we're back now. Great, fantastic. Our next speaker will be Professor Mervyn Frost, who is a professor of international relations here in the Department of War Studies. Thank you, Alvina. I'm aware of time. I will simply go like a steam train until you say stop and I will stop. And by then, even if I haven't reached the end, people will know where the train is going. <clears throat> so the word fog is a well-known phrase in the fog of war. And it might be taken to mean breakdown, chaos, disorder, or anarchy. It may be taken to suggest a state of affairs that is completely chaotic. Where things are like this, it might be thought that talk of ethics is a waste of time. For ethical questions usually arise in some kind of stable order. So for example, we might ask, when is it ethical for the police to use force? Or is the use of waterboarding justified against the person suspected of planning some terrorist act and so on? <clears throat> now the just war tradition is presented to us in the literature as having two parts, the use of bellum and the use in bellow. But all just war theorists kind of presuppose a two-step uh, process. The one is a description of a messy state of affairs we understand as war. This is like a snapshot uh, taken from above. And the second introduces ethics and asks from an ethical point of view, uh, what ought to be done um, and so on. But in both cases, there's the description and then the ethical question. It is this standard conception that I want to challenge in the five, four minutes that are left to me now. <clears throat> My challenge is easily stated. And here's the punchline. Fighting is doing. It does not involve random irrational behavior, but action. Soldiers, sailors, airmen and women, spies, special forces, strategists, and so on, all the way through. They are participating in a war, they are doing things. And you can only do things in the context of a practice with its association, associated rules and embedded ethics. So the complete set of actions that comprise a war is not some pre-ethical reality in the face of which ethical decisions have to be made. Action is ethically laden from the outset. Even in the deepest fog of war, ethics is, uh, as it were, embedded in what goes on there. So there's a heading, action and ethics. So quickly, all human action, including making war, can only be understood in the practice in which it is constituted as an action of a certain kind. So today I'm giving a short paper, very short, uh, at, the, at this conference. And you can only understand what I'm doing in the context of university life. I needn't elaborate on that. So the professors, libraries, teachers, and seminar rooms. And you can only understand what I'm doing insofar as you understand that this practice of ours has got an embedded ethics to do with the pursuit of knowledge. And that is similarly the case in all the actions that we conduct in warfare. So my talk then is about the ethical constitution of actors. So in order to be an actor in the social practice, one has to be constructed in it by a process of mutual recognition. So I am only a professor insofar as you recognize me as such, all of you and others. And Vladimir Zelensky is only a president of Ukraine because he's recognized as such by the citizens of the Ukraine and by all of us, the rest of the international community. This point about actors being constituted within social practices applies to all social practices from sports, universities, through to states and international organizations. Now, when a person is constituted as such within a social practice, that actor by virtue of being constituted in that way 
is bound by the ethical components of the practice in which is constituted as such. So for you to be students in, in universities, you have to be bound by these ethical constraints. It is a condition of you being a student. And similarly, in warfare, the participants are bound by the ethical constraints in the practice in which they are constituted as soldiers, sailors, spies, or whatever. If you flout those constraints, you get expelled from the community that you belong to. So if you flout the constraints of university life, you will be expelled and not recognized as a scholar if, you, if I was discovered to have plagiarized this whole little bit and so on. So from the point of view of a participant in a practice, the worst thing that can happen to you is to lose your standing as a member of that practice. So for all of us, especially uh, senior old people like me, the worst thing that could happen would be to be deconstructed as a professor. If I was found to have plagiarized a whole book, I would be kicked out, drummed out of King's. And the same applies to international actors and the actors who make war. They have to comply with these things, otherwise they will no longer be con uh, constituted. So this analysis indicates that in everything an actor does in the social formations in which he's constituted as an actor of that kind, he, she, it is vulnerable to ethical criticisms. This is as applicable to actors engaged in war as in other domains. So a primary imperative of actors, war fighters included, must be avoid, to avoid ethical criticism that deconstructs them as a participant in that practice. Now the implications here are utterly profound and not often recognized. In war, an actor might be winning a physical battle, in other words, killing more people, destroying more fighting machines, downing more aircraft and drones. But all of this has no heft whatsoever if the actor is flouting the ethics of the practice, because if the actor is doing that, the actor will be excluded as a pariah. Good, thank you. So the South African case is a very nice one. The National Party government in the old days had military superiority. They killed dozens, hundreds, and tortured hundreds more of the ANC. So they were winning the military battle, but they were losing their status as a participant in the global practice of states. So they were declared pariahs. So I, I've got lots more here, but you, you can see where this is all going. What matters in international relations, and you can see it in the Ukraine, is there's an ongoing battle to maintain their ethical status. So Putin tries to maintain his case that he is a wronged party in some sense, but the whole question then turns on, is his ethical argument stronger than the allies, the Ukrainian ethical argument? So everything turns on the ethical case being made and the military stuff is secondary to that and I'm finished. Fantastic, thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful timekeeping from Professor Frost. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers left, so please stay with us. And as you have questions, please post them in the Q&A um, little button here, or if you're in the room, obviously you can join later when we open it up. So our penultimate speaker will be Lily Muller, who has just recently submitted a PhD here in the department is awaiting her defense in a couple of weeks. So Lily, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alina. Uh... Thank you so much. Honored to be here today to discuss these contemporary issues around how to study war and the theoretical and methodological tools that we can mobilize in the struggle for to understand developments and trajectories in our contemporary era with these very esteemed colleagues that thank you for bringing. Um, my intervention will be, as Alina just mentioned, uh, based on my research I just conducted in my PhD, where I argue for a transformation of how we study cybersecurity away from defining what cybersecurity is towards understanding what cybersecurity. So most studies currently in the field of international relations and critical security studies focus on cybersecurity and cyber war by looking at big events. So Stuxnet is a big event of the nuclear power plant in Iran. Now there's a lot of studies that focus on Ukraine um, where they look at experts or threat actors and then base their theorization on these um, cases to then say something about what cyber war and cybersecurity is. So I, however, it might also flip this perspective around. And rather than trying to define what cybersecurity is or what it's not through these cases, I, in my research, start from the other side and examine how cybersecurity 
and cyber threats are relationally made and focusing on how it's made in the everyday by the technicians that both create cyber threats and cybersecurity in that practice. So focusing on this uh, in significant everyday, I argue, can transform how we understand and study the use of digital technology and cyber weapons in war. So to do this in the short time, I'll illustrate um, why it's important that we do this. And my intervention will be structured as follows. I will first, in the interest of time, draw on the case of Ukraine, even though it's, yeah, it's fresh in our minds and it needs a little context, so I'll just draw on that. Um, so I'm not using it as a case to show how cyber has changed, uh, but rather to make this argument that the dangers of certain way of thinking about war and cyber war and the consequences that it has to focus on these events uh, for how these problems are understood. So secondly, based on this case, I will present a different way to understand cybersecurity. So with the case of Ukraine, um, cyber war was suddenly back in the specter of what everyone was talking about. And when Russia was building up their military along the Ukrainian border, many analysts stressed the potential for destabilizing and devastating cyber attacks. So seen professors such as Jason Haley at the University of Columbia predicted that if Russia invades, the opening salvo is likely to be with offensive cyber capabilities. And William Courtney and Peter Wilson from Rand suddenly warned that massive employment of cyber warfare tools will create shock and awe, causing Ukraine's defense or will to fight to collapse. So accordingly, the United States and the United Kingdom deployed cyber war teams to help the Ukrainians defend against these impeding strategic cyber strikes against its critical national infrastructure. And some even went further, suggesting that Russia may not even need to use their military force at all as cyber strikes could achieve much the same effect from across the border. And this assessment was actually shared by policymakers working uh, to counter the Russian threat uh, with anonymous senior Biden administration officials supporting this in official views. So, but no side war happened. So uh, as previous uh, professor at King's Thomas Ritz in his works, cyber war did not take place. And we're left wondering where is this cyber war? And all the discussions following or how is this not happening? as the tanks drove in and more conventional uh, tools of war were deployed. So it's not a new observation. Thomas Ridd and John Stowe then had this uh, discussion right in 2012, uh, if cyber war would take place or not. Um, so there's a long trajectory of discussing. Um, I'm not saying I'm the first one to make this point. What I am saying is that with all these discussions and theorization in place, why did this not happen? How did the cyber war become so expected and how are we so shocked that it didn't happen? So what I'm arguing is that the theoretical and methodological tools that uh, critical security studies and science and technology studies give us guides um, us to study cyber war and cybersecurity to the everyday practices and how these threats and risks are made. And if we do what the, these uh, tools give us and study the everyday practitioners and experts that make cybersecurity, uh, we can gain understanding what cybersecurity actually is when it's practiced. And when we do that, we can see how cyber weapons are built and how they're detected um, and secured against and used. Um, and if we have that knowledge, we can actually already preempt that in the case of Ukraine, there is no shock and awe in cyber weapons and cyber war. Um, with the time I have, I'll just very quickly go over some of them. So if we look at this of war, the title is, um, through this interdisciplinary lens I'm uh, advocating, we firstly see there is no cyber bomb that fits all. You can't just build a cyber weapon and put it on a shelf and have it ready when you need it. Um, it takes time to build, it takes precision and inside knowledge and access to the systems that you want to attack. So the cyber weapon needs to be continuously built and updated as the technological systems are updated. So a consequence of that is, for example, this expectation also from the West that we, they would attack the Russian military. But obviously, they will have extremely secure military systems. It's not like you just build um, a bomb that will attack their digital infrastructure. Um, and yes, uh, the Russian sponsored Sandworm Packing Group did try and sabotage the Ukrainian power grid in the last months. However, it was hastily put together a uh, cyber operation and it was discovered very early by the victims and hence it had no consequence. Um, so we come with this risk of, in cyber war once we actually understand how it's built these cyber weapons that 
you never really know how the weapon is going to work and when it works the effect so the the time that is so relevant in war uh, becomes a third so to summarize uh, the implications of the methodology i'm um, suggesting or advocate for uh, towards this focusing on the everyday shows that rather than following the brilliant narratives and discourse in cybersecurity that is the big next thing in war uh, cyber weapons and use of cyber in war takes place alongside all the other classical forces of um, war. It's a supporter, but it's not this whole new way of fighting war. And that goes for the question of the terrorists too. So the last point is that cyber can be used alongside the conventional ways of fighting war, but it's less likely to be the same next thing. But cybersecurity and cyber techs and malicious actors and weapons are real. I'm not saying they're not important. And it's of utmost important that we secure against this threat to our society and the state and everyday systems. But it's not as much the classical war sets. It's hence we need to shift where and how we understand the battlefields. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We all look forward to seeing this research out in the world. And that leads us to our final speaker, Professor Didier Bigot, who's um, also a professor of international relations here in the Department of War Studies. And I'll be sharing my screen as we go. And you tell me when to go next to the next slides. So is yours, Didier. Thank you very much. We have done a research in the journal Cultures et Conflits about uh, 20 years of war and counterterrorism. We have presented, I say we, it's a collective of uh, more than 16 people in different places in the world. In the world. Each time, we are back to the question, what about you? Mm -hmm. So my question for today is, do we have a paradigm change concerning war studies with invasion of Ukraine by is it the end of liberal globalization and of liberal wars against terror? Are the logics and practice of counterterrorism obsolete? Or have they been extended to a point that was not imagined by the Western countries when they have initiated it? Thus, it is a difficult question to answer, and only time will give some kind of answer. We cannot answer now, and the one who say they can are blind. Important in terms of expertise. What you cannot do is as much important as what you say you can do. So if like Joseph Borrell say narrative and cultural misunderstanding are fed by the misrecognition of others and mimetic rivalry, quoting René Girard. And if they are the currency of international relations, then it is important to think carefully about the friends of war and the grievability and precarity of the form of life they generate. And I refer, of course, to Jennifer. Next slide. Are we back to the reality of international wars of real? That's a little bit what some geopolitician invading the TV and unseen from the end of the Cold War are back again. <clears throat> they read with delight the fight between Ukraine and Russia through the frame of what did not happen during the Cold War between USSR and the West with the invasion by tanks of Europe. So is Ukraine the poster child? of the Western civilization to help, or is Ukraine the adolescent forgetting its Eastern roots and fatherhood and obliged to realize that is geography imposed forever to take its standard? That's the so-called lesson of geopolitics, the so-called rule of being neighbor of strong states. And it explained a little bit uh, the position of Bedrin and Macron themselves, if you are interested about a little bit of French and European politics. So we have now a dance of death around, next slide, the dance of death around liberal values to be defended, heroic acts, 
and the legal agreement consecrated or not by NATO, which is delimited. The toll of death and the number of civilian victims in Ukraine necessary for change of attitude. They are the curses of indignation and regret. Who deserve not to die, to die with honor, to die without recognition, to be forgotten? The frame of Western ethics and boundaries lie between all where this dimension of values and norms and the ideas that legality is norm. Melvin has explained that it's not the case, of course, that it's embedded into practice and not into the legal document. So we can see why you have so much narrative of genocide, of right crime, war crime, or on the contrary, of previous war in history justifying that when you are on war, you can do what you want. And you can see that the day-to-day -day image of war violence report on intimate situation of those suffering, at the effect of presenting the suffering at distance as an ethical move of proximity, while the repetition of images renders the banality of the war nearby us but profoundly under. We don't want to. And that's where is the problem. We can say that NATO has developed more and more this idea with the idea that arms sales can be a form of peacemaking. I jump that, we can go back to it. But of course, you have really a, a research to do of every example of war which have been limited by a technological leapfrog, where you help a country to go even more into a high level technical war, or do you, you create more difference? And of course, you have to analyze here, not only the public and the soldier, but all the role of the private companies and the arms sales company and how they are in partnership with their elements. How do we analyze the role of armed dealers? How do we analyze the fact that already some companies are in Ukraine to discuss about reconstruction? So it's this form of cynicism that we have to analyze into this mentality of war, which has been done. More importantly, we have seen that we are incapable to read the Russian counterterrorism discourse. Why? Because in some way, we don't want to analyze what they say because they dare to say that we Westerners are the terrorists and that we are supporting neo-Nazis, that we are the one to be fight against with a vocabulary which is exactly the one of counterterrorism, special operations, not war, anti nazism potential regime change, freedom versus terrorism worldwide, survival of the nation, merging between internal and external situations. So, what this counterterrorism Russian discourse do is that it creates sideration of the world. Sideration is the philosophical sense that we cannot just realize that it's a good uh, I finish by, is it difficult to take a side step, to think outside of the book, of the book, sorry, to use Bourdieu formula? And it is even more the case for Wokster. This side step is seen by actors engaged in legitimacy fight for their own violence as a betrayal. And we are both to admit that it's understandable for their own point of view. But what we need is to have the courage to point out their similarity in terms of practice of violence, even if they insist to absolutize the difference and to impose a diabolization of the adversary. This is this analysis of frame of war and understanding of who are credible, which can give you some lessons and methods to go beyond 
the Mentanico. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Wonderful timekeeping again. So that leaves us with um, about 20 minutes to 25 minutes for Q&A. And we already have a couple of questions in the box, which I'll read out. And then you, know, you pick them up as you, as you see fit. And of course, if anyone in the room has a question, you can just raise your arm. So the first question is actually for Francesco, Francisco, sorry. Um, so uh, Carl Islam is asking, in the context of IHL, are norms also derived from obligations erga omnes? Um, maybe I'll add a few more questions because I also have a question to, uh, from Stefan. Do you want to ask them or shall I read them out? Do you want to stand up and speak up? Yeah. Addressing the question quite a long way. So I, after Mervyn's talk, I, I, I posed the question to Mervyn and did to what extent is the invasion of um, of the war and maybe merging uh, kind of like an imperial totalitarian uh, practice. So is that a turning point in history? And I think you spoke to this question a lot. Thank you very much. So just to repeat, to what extent the invasion of Ukraine has been emerging of um, imperial totalitarian forms of war and practices. And finally, another question from Carl Islam, this time to Mervyn. He's asking, in Professor John Mearsheimer's offensive realism paradigm, international politics appears to be a practical exercise and not a moral one. If that theory is valid and applies to a conflict involving an aspiring hegemon, for example, China, and does it follow that no ethical standards are applicable to relations between states? For example, because universal moral principles cannot be applied to the actions of states. So maybe we'll turn it back to the panelists for now. Um, Francisco, uh, do you want to yeah, begin and then um, we'll go around? Okay, um, yeah, I'll try to be brief, but it's fairly technical. So, um, okay, every use go against norm. I don't know if they can hear me okay, but let Just me speak know. up, yeah. Okay, every use go against norm. Uh, entails an obligation to respect it from everybody. That's what uh, erga omnes means. Uh, everybody is obligated to respect them, right? Um, I mean, the law, we have these Dogen's rules and we have erga omnes obligations and they overlap sometimes, but not always. So you can have uh, erga omnes obligations that are not at the same time as Dogen's norms, right? So for instance, freedom of navigation, which is like a, a longstanding principle in international law, since times of Grotius and even the Romans. So that is an erga omnis obligation, but uh, in, 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 when it's not a, a Euskogan standard, not, not yet at any rate. Um, the, the rules of IHL, uh, insofar as they are Euskogan's norms, the basic rules of IHL, of the law of armed conflict, um, entail obligations erga omnis, but we have to be more specific. This is something that, that many states have actually suggested, like Austria or the the United States, uh, we need to define more clearly what we mean, uh, but uh, what, yeah, what we mean by uh, the basic principles of international humanitarian law. Um, if we define them, then we can we can say yes, they are used to against and therefore erga omnis. But not every rule of IHL uh, entails obligations erga omnis. Um, I don't know if, if that's clear, but it seems like Carl has some background in the law, so hopefully that was enough. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, next, I would like to invite Vivian to come in and um, answer Stefan's question, and then we have Didier, and then you can answer Stefan as well as the other question. So Vivian, please join us back here. Hi, Stefan, really good question. Is the war in Ukraine imperialist and can we characterize it as totalitarian? As I said in my, uh, in, in my talk, I want to use this concept of totalitarian war because uh, I, I actually see this uh, war as in, in terms of totalitarianism and the way Hannah Arendt uh, describes totalitarianism. Why do I characterize it as such? It's because it is absolutely related to politics within Russia. Uh, it's about, I connect it to the idea of, um, ah, I, I'm getting a message here that says, um, that says I was muted. So, so Stefan, I, I hope you can hear me and everybody else. Um, how do I characterize the war in, in, in the Ukraine? I, I see it as a, indeed, a, 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 in a sense, a continental um, imperialist, uh, pan-nationalist war, 
But I've also characterized it as totalitarian because I see it as connected to uh, the internal politics within, within Russia. It's, it's related to the idea of the right to what I would refer to, again, borrowing from Hannah Arendt, the idea of the right to politics uh, and, and, and the notion of self-determination and, and the right to politics. So this would be my, uh, in a sense, two characterizations of this war. It's not a global war. It's not a war about, in a sense, um, about a global remit. Uh, it's not a war about humanity. Um, as the discourses of, of uh, what I called liberal wars and what others have called liberal wars were. Um, it's not about humanitarianism, it's not about counterterrorism and so on, but rather it's about this core concept, which is the right to politics. It's a war against the right to politics. Fantastic, thank you very much, Vivian. Next, um, Didier, do you want to answer Stefan's yes. question? So I will say, whatever you think, which is a frame of war, never reduce the analysis of war on your own frame. I think that's a lesson from conflicts only. Who drive the dynamics of conflict? It's never you. Your own frame is important for the enemy, but the frame of the enemy is important for you. So you need to parallelize and to analyze what are the frames of war of all the participants. The military participant, the intelligence service participant, the politician, they are three different actors. The private people who are there, the NGOs, and that's very important, and the laws, which are very important in the decision about legislation. So you have always multiple frames of war with different forms of driven. That's why I, I will insist, because that's one of the lessons of the critical approach of uh, politics. If you reduce to one main understanding, then you go back always, always to jail. And that's what is necessary to avoid the alternative of values for politics is also uh, an alternative which will not render, which will render part of it, but never gives a sense of the difference. We are in a relational perspective. That's what is absolutely central for us. Thank you, Vivi. And Mervyn. I want to answer that the Mia Shana question. And I think what my answer would have something to, to do uh, with what Didi has just said, but it would be critical of what Didi has just said, is uh, Mearsheimer starts from this point of view that here we are, experts, war studies experts, facing a world, and out there are states. And then we experts start analyzing how the states might or might not relate to each other, each with its own ideology, and so on. The point of view that I presented here is quite contrary to that. It says to be a state is to already be a participant in a global practice with its, with its rules of the game, if you want to call it that. And to be a participant in that practice, you have to be shown to already adhere to certain ethical values. So the Miyashima picture of, well, it's just a balance of power doesn't explain how we already understand these things to be states. And the states understand each other to be states. And they understand each other to have certain duties and privileges and uh, actions available to them, one of which is making war, one of which is going to the International uh, Criminal Court if you want. There are all sorts of maneuvers that states make. I guess the most conspicuous, of course, is they all participate in global uh, uh, diplomacy. And they all participate, pretty much them, all of them participate in the UN system. So the big uh, divide here is between people like Mearsheimer and other, what I call sociologists, who think they're looking at the thing from the outside. There is no outside in this case. We're all citizens of states. All the states are internal to the practice of states. And the ethical arguments are inside there. 
So Putin's having an argument with us inside that practice. And what we have to do is evaluate the argument. I mean, that's what we do day in and day out. And we think he's losing. And I think he also knows he's losing. That's enough. Great, thank you. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Do we have any questions in the room? Otherwise I will abuse my, uh, yeah, go ahead, please, Lola. Yeah, just to take up this conversation, just to yeah. go back to Tia's wonderful publication about the relational and the ethical and readability. It seems to me that, the, you know, you say this relational thing is this group of actors who constitute war, but surely there are huge ethical tensions in what is around, what is considered to be within them. Uh, yes, I think it's central, once again, uh, it's all the actors. That's the first time I'm compared with my children. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, what is central, I think, to that is really to come back to the sensitivity of Judith Butler and the way she has changed the perspective of the world by introducing a key element which pushed the question of ethics into a system of practice. And that's why, why I think we are in agreement on that. And that what is important is that if we continue to say that Russia is just what we want them to be without looking at what they say we are, we don't believe. They consider we are terrorists. We are their and so they consider Ukraine to be legitimately decimated without any problem, even if they are from the same team. And that's where it's a problem, because they are not in a nationalist world. They don't want, they don't consider Ukraine as them. They consider some Ukrainian as terrorists that can be eradicated. The terminology used by the Russian has been word by word the one we have used in Europe. Mm -hmm. Think about it. And then you can see why people like Lula in Brazil is not ready to go on the West side because he used that. And I'm in contact with a lot of people in Latin America. And they have that in mind because they are not directly in the conflict. And they say, well, you cannot just now go back to one frame of war or you are the great, great good and the other is the absolute. Maybe we, we have to, to stand for our value. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not okay, but we need also to do this move more to go outside of the battlefield. That's our role as well. Thank you, Didier. I'd like to use the last sort of six minutes um, to also invite um, Lola and Lily to join this discussion. So my first question, um, kind of building on this theme of, you know, pluralizing the actors, the stakes, the themes that are emerging from the study of war. And it actually builds on something Vivian mentioned earlier about looking at the UN, the different interventions, African states coming in and kind of reframing what's at stake. Um, do we also see maybe the emergence of new kinds of alliances, different kinds of imaginaries? So not only does economist geopolitical thinking, but it, you know, we can kind of build on what Vivian said earlier. And then for Lola, especially in, in terms of art and artists, um, obviously in war, art is also being targeted. And that's sort of one of the symbols to eradicate the, the nation, right? So we've heard a lot in the first few weeks about um, Ukraine artists, their homes um, and artworks being targeted by Russian campaigns and, and you know, quite deliberately so. So to think a little bit also about the role of artists themselves, not just art, but artists and kind of transnational transversal alliances. And finally for Lily, um, could you open up this little cybersecurity black box and just walk us through these relations that you uncovered of how this threat is constructed again through this plurality of different actors that are kind of you know, part of this process. Um, okay, so how about we start with Lola and then Lily and then Vivian, if you wanna add something to that, um, we can have you coming in again and then we'll close the panel. So Lola, please. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that's a lovely question. Um, I've been very interested in the difference between activism and art. 
And it seems to me, just to pick up on what Julia was saying, is that, and, she, and Judith Butler is very interested in that, particularly that it's this binding, it's a, a solidarity ethics. Uh, and that, that solidarity ethic binds its participants into, well, the video in Ukraine. You know, it, it becomes a, an activism for Ukraine at this point. And, and I get quite annoyed, actually, quite often, because art is then used up. And there's a huge ethical problem. And what I was trying to say is that in this pra practice of this, in this ethical education, it's much wider. I don't mean to say that it doesn't do all of the resistant things that I, I, I make use of the analytics and resistance at the same time. But it seems to me that there's um, a kind of openness in the practice of art that resists that kind of activist co-optation. So the, the, the ethics of art are actually open. They are pluralizing and relational. And that's very different to the solidarity ethics of activism. And, and I think that's a very important point to make. Everybody forgets those to slide art into activism. And uh, what, I'm, so what I'm trying to say is something that what art does. And art does it obliquely. It does it through this hefty term called aesthetic education, which of course is much more than educational. It's experiential. It's provocative. It changes you in ways that you don't exactly know how. And to come back to um, <clears throat> censorship of that, we know that most totalitarian regimes resist that. They resist art precisely because it does its work be before you even know it's done its work. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an enormous potential for that, for understanding what art does before anybody knows that it does. <coughs> Fantastic, thank you. Lily, you're next. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the air conditioning. Um, so thank you for that great question, Alina. Um, it's not really on the same level of the discussion going on here, but um, to open up the black book of the, in a minute of the other groups or actors involved in um, cyber war, I think the main point I'm trying to make, and I mentioned I had earlier, is that the current discourse when it comes to Ukraine has been looking a lot at Russia as a state or the groups connected as hacker groups and uh, that they're what it holds the report we need to talk about now, but especially when it comes to cybersecurity, the constructors of this digital space are both making the weapons and security of it. And they really have a lot more power in, and they keep studying them gives us insight in what's happening in the Ukrainian war in another time and dimension as well. So it's not that urgency of being before, but it's more fluid of what happened um, in the, I mean, Russia and Ukraine have been in war for like 10 years now. It's not a new thing. So if you study what's happened in that space in the years past, it's easier to also understand what's happening as is now also behind the scenes. If you speak to the like, members of NATO, there's been a lot of conflict and attacks. And the one thing they do say is that Russia has actually been very successful in fighting in the digital domain just because of the attacks have been successful and we don't see that we only look at what's being said by in between the states or uh, fantastic and finally i know vivian if you want to come in and say a few final words on some of these questions that we just raised thank you very much alvina uh i i think just finally really the question is about how is this war being looked at globally. If we take a, a relational understanding of this particular war, we need to look at it from the viewpoint of the rest of the world. So uh, whereas the Mearsheimers of this world and many commentators just simply look at this war in, in from, from the perspective of the West, once again, in a sense, rendering the world in terms of uh, you know, in, in Cold War terms, really, just, just to refer back to what Didier was saying. But if you look at it from the vantage point of the mass of the rest of the world, namely the post-colonial world, what you see is a, is a distinct idea of the value of the post-colonial political community. What does post-colonial community mean? Uh, and, and in a sense, those communities are, are applying this idea to what is going on in, in, in Ukraine. And, and they see a kind of, there, there, there are memories of that, uh, of the condition that they were under during the colonial era. 
And just to remind people of Franz Fanon's notion of uh, post-colonial cosmopolitanism, this is a cosmopolitanism not of acquisition, not of liberal globalism and, and so on and so on. It's a cosmopolitanism of solidarity. And this is what you see in a number of speeches that were made in the relevant UN Security Council as well as General Assembly um, speeches. And, and really I urge people to look at those. Thanks very much, Alvina. Fantastic, thank you so much, everyone. So that's right on time. So very good timekeeping. Thank you all so much for joining us both online as well as in person in this kind of hybrid digital world that we're all still navigating. Um, so let's finish off with a round of applause for our amazing interdisciplinary panel. And hopefully it's helped you to kind of make sense of this fog of war and how to approach a current condition and transformations of, of war. So thank you very much.